Happy Thursday! Mike from Hound Dog Media here, and it's time for another episode of Con to Couch. With so many conventions delayed or canceled this year, we're bringing the best guests and the coolest hangouts of that experience right to you in the comfort of your own home. I'd like to welcome you to our first episode of Couch Chat, a one-on-one -on -one hangout with the most interesting and accomplished guests you'd otherwise see on the convention scene. Today, we're thrilled to have one of Hollywood's most innovative and groundbreaking creators joining us. Without further ado, here's our host, Jack Clemens, with writer and creator Daniel Knopf. Everybody, thanks for joining us tonight on Couch Chats, and uh, I'm I'm just going to let you get right in introducing yourself, Dan. Can you tell everybody most or some of your accomplishments? Uh, you got yeah. quite the resume. Well, I, I I I broke in in I broke into the to, to television in my mid 40s with a show called Carnival that was a uh, um, it was on HBO, and so I I I. I I, I came into the game really, really late in life um, and didn't kind of work my way up. I mean, my first gig was I was a creator and executive producer on an HBO series. So <laughs> I jumped right to the top, right to the front of the line. Um, and then I, since then, I did, uh, I did, did an episode of Supernatural and I did a show called Standoff and I did Spartacus Blood and Sand for Stars. And that was about a season. It was the first season, the one with Andy. Um, and great show, uh, fantastic was, show. Yeah, it was a great show. And Steve Denight created it, and he's really uh, incredibly uh, talented guy. And um, I did uh, Dracula, which was one 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 in one season with NBC. And then I did uh, I did um, uh, the Blacklist for three years. For NBC, and uh, and then now I'm I'm doing a series for Ron Howard's company, Imagine uh, Kids and Family, that is a real change up for me because it's a it's a it's a family show called The <laughs> Astronauts. I have no idea how I ended up on their list. I I, I feel like Spartacus was kind of a family show, you know, <laughs> like I, yeah, the Manson yep. family. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, interesting. And you were a writer and a producer on a number of these shows, correct? I've been a writer and producer on all the shows, except for the episode of Supernatural I did, which I just, you know, which was like a kind of a weird thing. I just um, just woke yeah. up one day and wrote a Supernatural episode. <laughs> no, it was really weird. It was like I, I came off of Carnival because I came out of nowhere. I mean, I sold Carnival literally off the internet. I, well, so let's, I, let's go back to that. Let's go back to Carnival <laughs> first, and let's just yeah. work our way through. Talk to us about Carnival. Well, I I created this thing around the around around the turn of the century. Um, you know, in the in the in, it was in the nineties actually, and I created this thing. I thought it was a. I wanted to be a screen. I was trying to be a screenwriter, and I and I'd had a little bit of success, but not much. I had a, a western that got made. And I decided, I tried to write this, I had this idea for a, a movie, I thought, and I got about 200 pages into it and I realized that this is just, I, and I, I really realized this is not a movie, uh, this is something else. And I put it away for about a decade and, and then I took it out and I thought, well, maybe it's TV series. And so I talked to some people I knew had done TV and so I fashioned it into a pilot. And by then I was, you know, in my 40s, and I'm thinking, God, who am I fooling? Nobody breaks into TV in their 40s. That's like, you know, you got to be a, you know, you, you know, people now when they're breaking into TV, it's like they're stem cells, you know what I mean? So um, I kind of thought, well, okay, I put that away for a while. And then I posted on the internet, I created a website and posted all my, the first acts of everything I'd done, I got a call from a guy. He put me in touch with his boss, who was Scott Winant. And Scott is an Emmy-winning director, and was he told his 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 uh, development guy Robert Kaobot, he said, "Hey Robert, I I'm sick of doctors, cops, and lawyers. Find me something different." And Robert found Carnival online, and so I came and talked to them, and then we talked to another gentleman named Howard Klein, and he took us all into a room at HBO and we pitched it to Carolyn Strauss and they bought it and they made it. And I, and um, so I, I just really could come out of, I was a fan, I was a consumer of this product, you know? And so uh, suddenly I'm 
I'm I'm uh, I'm an executive producer and the and and the creator of a television series on HBO right around the time the Sopranos were on. It was sort of the golden age of HBO, and uh, and so nobody knew who you know nobody knew who I was. I mean, there was I've I've, I've read things on my IMDb page where there's like a rumor that I'm actually David Lynch. And, I, and that was this. I don't. Can you exist. speak to the truth of that? Are you in fact David Lynch? Will this be our groundbreaking? No, I'm not. I'm not. I, I okay. Was, he's a massive influence on me. But there are people who are saying that David that Daniel Knopf doesn't exist, and that he's just a nom de plume for David Lynch, which is like really flattering. But it's not super great for your brand. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, if it turns out you are him, just go ahead and wink at me a few times throughout the show. I won't tell anyone, but we'll. Me and you will know. I've never um, met. I've never met David. I've met his daughter Jennifer, who's delightful, but I've never met David. And I, I'm afraid I'll just get, I'll just be, be fall into a puddle of fanboy. You know? <laughs> That's how I was meeting some of my favorite authors. So I totally understand. Um, I don't. I don't get. I don't get. I don't get all starstruck by actors ever. But God, I've I've met like Harlan Ellison and 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 and. Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and I just become a public goo. I, I'm, I can't put, it to, you know, that's like, I get the feeling they're going, is your friend got like, is he okay? Did he have a stroke or something? <laughs> Should we get help? Yeah, yeah. So what is, could you give us the elevator pitch for Carnival? What what was it? Um, it was basically, a, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was an epic. It was a, a it was, it was, it was, a, it was, it was an epic about, um good and evil and the idea being that in each generation um that that that, that there's there's a an, like an avatar like one of the avatars would be jesus you know right um of of good and an avatar of evil it's born to each generation. the whole idea being god and the devil realize okay we really can't go head to head anymore okay so what we're going to do is we're going to create this this planet and we're going to people it with these ape-like sort of sentient creatures and let them fight a proxy war for us. And we'll each get one man in per generation and see how things go. And it, the story of Carnival was the last, the last generation of those avatars before, before mankind as a species got to a point to where we created the the atom bomb, and at that point, God kind of said, "Okay, well, yeah, you know what? You're all grown up now. Here's the car keys. You're off. <laughs> you know, we're the, the age of magic. It's the last age of magic was supposed to take place just before World War II or into hmm. World War II. So, the idea of the 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 explosion at Trinity being the moment where mankind entered." his adolescence as a species so ch childhood things went away things like miracles and magic stopped being operative um and so that, that was the concept it's pretty highfalutin isn't it? no i'm in <laughs> I, i'm gonna go add it to my watch list like right now oh um, yeah if you haven't seen it you'll dig it, it, it i'm i'm i i was like i kind of want i hadn't seen it yet and i'd known uh, that you were coming on the show i was like i should watch it i'm like now I want to have him pitch it to me. I, I want was, to hear it, it from was, the creator's it, mouth. It was well over two or three weeks ahead of its time. I got to let you know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this was your your first professional writing. You said you had done something a little bit before, but not not to this scale. No, I I sold some things. I sold a western that HBO of all people had bought ten years before Carnival, and. It was a Western called Blind Justice. Do you know the Zatuichi films? Yes. Oh, oh, okay. yes. Well, I did. I did. Basically, I wrote a spaghetti Western kind of in the same vein with the lead was a blind guy, was a blind gunslinger. And I've heard of Armand this. DeSante was in it. And, yes, I've heard yeah. of it. Um, also, who could make a Western off of Japanese film? Who could expect that to do well? Like, uh, yeah. So HBO did that. And then I. And I remember being in Arizona and thinking, God, what if this is it? What if this is like the only thing I ever sell? And for like 10 years, it was, it, it, yeah, you know, I, I, I sold nothing. So, um, you know, it was like, it, it, then, then Carnival happened and then I was a TV guy, you know, and so, and I've been doing pretty well ever since. You know? So 
we have a lot of authors of books come onto the show. Uh, I'm an author in the very small sense. I'm on team and more. I'm in a lot of collections. Uh, uh-huh. Do you think there's a real difference between writing a book or a story and writing a show, in your opinion? Yeah, there's a profound difference. Um, when you're writing a novel, um, especially if it's especially if it's a th- in third person. I mean, look, you know, if you're writing a first person novel, you're stuck inside the eyes of that character. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So your your storytelling is limited only by what that character is seeing, feeling, hearing, whatever. Um, but even in, the, in that case, even if it's your, if, if you're not going omniscient. You have access to all five senses. You can evoke, uh, you can talk about the scent of fresh mown grass. You know, you can talk about um, hearing, seeing, sensing, you know, you can talk, you can, you can call up all those things. And when you're a dramatist and you're doing something that's audio visual, all you have is what people can see and what people can hear. Unless you employ the use of a narrator, which is sort of like cheating but even then, you know, I mean, really what you, you're stuck with two out of five senses. And so it's like, you're really kind of, it's like, it's like getting into a ring and fighting. Um, yeah. Like for instance, you could say, um, you know, Jim looked at his wife. It was their anniversary. I will always love you. He lied. <laughs> right. <laughs> you can't do that in a film. You know, you can't do that in a so you're really you you you're really you're really dependent on things that can be seen, um, and and performed and heard and and so it's a it's a much more it's a much more di- it's a much more disciplined form of writing. You're also a novel can be 500 pages. It can be a no- a novella. Um, you're kind of like okay, there's a certain amount of real estate. It's expensive to to capture these images and. And so every minute is, it's not a forgiving form, you know, so you really have to be, you have to make sure that if you're going to spend that money, you're not wasting it. Every minute has to either push the story or push the characters, you know? So I liken it. It's like, if have you written poetry? Yes. Well, you know, the, the more reduced the form, I mean, the most, the most difficult form of poetry not to write, but to write well is, is like a haiku, you know? Yes. And any asshole can write a mediocre haiku, but to write a really just, just splendid haiku is really almost impossible. And so screenplays, there's a lot less words in them than there is in a novel. And so, you know, it, it's a little bit more, I think it's more difficult. I've written prose too, and I, prose is kind of, Prose is fun because you can just go off on a tangent with prose and you just can't really, you can't do that with film, you know? Um, yeah, you get into these books where it's like all of a sudden they're talking about the history of, uh, the, the, the history of samurai culture and then they're back into the narrative. And it's like, you really can't go there in a movie unless you're Guy Ritchie and you do a quick, you know, montage for two seconds and jump back into your narrative, you know? But um, it's 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 a different form. It's a it's a it's a much more, and I think that's why it's there's not that many of us that, that get paid for it, you know, because um, it's really hard. Um, so anyway, no, no, that's I mean, I think a lot of people. <laughs> I, I would say that yeah, writing a book isn't that hard. Writing a good book is very difficult, but your your first story isn't that hard to type out in book form because you can educate the audience. Yeah. Um, and I guess I never really thought about the fact that you can't educate an audience cheaply in, in film. No, uh, no, you you can't, you can't just stop. You can't just turn off the narrative and drop anchor and start talking about say, okay, well, here's, you need to know this in order to appreciate, you need to know something about naval battles in order to appreciate what happened to the character in the next 25 pages. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the nature of you know, naval battle, and now we're going to get back into it, um, or his backstory, you know. Um, it's difficult to have that kind of a conversation with your audience if it costs, you know, if it's if it's costing $10,000 a minute 
to to produce right you know you just don't you don't have that we'll pause here and discuss the history of the world hold hold one um yeah so your your first show carnival goes um and then you you find yourself writing a supernatural episode which supernatural yeah. episode did you watch i know there are 800 of them i wrote the one called the strega which was the first episode that had the flashback to them as kids oh um that see now now all of a sudden i did carnival that got canceled after two years and and now i'm entering nobody knows who i am i have no contacts i haven't really nobody knows who i am so i'm kind of building a career now (laughs) i'm kind of just kind of ass backwards and eric kripke had me in to he was they were looking for somebody to staff the show and he had me in. I came in and pitched a couple of things. He said, oh, yeah, well, we're doing one like that. And we already did one like that. And, and what we're really looking for is something. But we can't. We want to do a witch episode. But we don't know how to make a witch scary. And I thought, oh, <laughs> I can make a witch scary. <laughs> and so I I wrote this episode. And and, uh, and it was the whole idea was to get on staff. Um they made the episode. The episode's one of the most popular episodes they had on the show in, in, in that season. And they, they didn't give me the staff job. So it's like, you fuckers. <laughs> I was like, this was an audition. I, and I passed with flying colors. I should, but they never offered me the staff position. So I just had the one episode on there, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, and since then, you know, the other things, you know, a lot of, um, the 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 uh, um, I had a I had an adaptation of the Phantom um, mm-hmm. that wasn't very good. It was it was sort of a cheap, uh, you know, um, uh, the production. They didn't spend a lot on it. I wrote that with my son. I did uh, Iron Man comics with my son, you know, for a couple also, of years. Tell us a little bit about that. Tell us about writing Iron Man with your son. That had to be an amazing experience. Well, it was weird. I finished Carnival. Marvel was saying, hey, you got canceled, but we want to continue the show. And I thought, well, that's great. So let's do that. And they got into conversations with HBO and HBO back then. HBO, I remember being on this show and going, what are we going to do at Comic-Con? And they were going, what's Comic-Con? I said, I mean, they were doing Sex in the City. <laughs> and they just weren't in genre stuff on HBO. I mean, they, they'd done Creep Show, but they weren't sort of about that and when it came down to marvel coming to them and saying hey we want to do a we want to continue the saga as a comic book or a series of 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 graphic novels they just said meh you know meh. so they marvel came back and he said well look we really want you to do one of our shit one of our heroes you know, one of our comics and we'll let you do anyone you want and i said i'd like I was I was a DC boy, you know. I was a Batman kid, but I I, my, I had friends that were Marvel, and I thought, yeah, I want to do Iron Man. Iron Man sounds really cool. So, uh, yeah, but I, I'm going to do it with my son because my son knows comic books, he knows the medium, and I don't, you know. But when I was a kid, yeah, back when I was a kid, um, but back when I was a kid. If you got caught reading a comic book and you were older than 12 years old, you know, you'd just be up for an ass kicking in the school parking lot. You know, and it, it wasn't, it was fairly recent where adults could read comic books. And my son right. was one of them. He was a big comic book fan and he wanted to be a comic book writer. And he knew the, he knew the hero, he knew all the conventions, he knew all of the, you know, things you could and couldn't do inside that medium. And I didn't know any of it. And, I, so I said, I'll do it, but I want to do it with my son because what I didn't want to do is what like Ang Lee did with Hulk. And I think people come into comic books thinking, I'm going to transcend this infantile form. And it's like, no, this is not, this is a fully formed, legitimate medium. And lots and lots of really cool things have been done in it. And you don't want to write down to this, you know? And I knew that my son would probably ensure that that didn't happen. So he said, yeah, okay, you can write it with your kid. I go, okay. So I call up my son and I go, hey, I got some news for you. We're going to be co-writing Iron Man together. And he goes, shut up. And I go, yeah, we're going to be 
co-writing Iron Man together. He goes, yeah, really funny, Dad. That's really funny. And it, it turned out it was April Fool's Day that day. <laughs> <laughs> so he thought I was messing with him. So we, we wrote Iron Man for uh, over two years. I think we did like 28 issues. We reintroduced the Mandarin. We we did a lot of fun stuff. And and I we I did an we did a Captain America. We then did a reboot of the uh, the Eternals. Charlie did most of the writing on that one. Um, and so I was doing that while I was doing the TV stuff too. You know. Do you feel like TV and comic book writing are similar because they're both visual mediums, or do you feel like there is a, a real difference? Well, I think that I think that talking about what we we're just talking about is as as a as as something gets more condensed as a format it becomes less forgiving and so comic books you know i mean you can't write he walks to the window <laughs> you're writing in stills it's a series of stills and you've got to tell an entire story with stills and there are some things like you can and and you know you're wholly reliant on the cap on the captions and on on your dialogue and you know what you what you emphasize in bold you know and 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 what i like best for sound effects you know crack you know and stuff like that um i love the sound effects my son was going oh that's so corny and i'd say no 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 we need to do like something big sound effect here you know um so yeah it's a it's it's a very difficult medium to do really well i i'm i'm in awe of some of the people who who uh who are certainly the, the artists, you know, um, but uh, and there's not a lot of people. Alan Moore is to me. I mean, he's amazing. Uh, you know, he's like Lee Poe. He's he's to tell stories as complex as he does, and to exploit that medium so thoroughly, to me is is kind of astonishing. So um, uh, yeah, but I enjoyed it. It was it's good. It was, it's hard. You don't get paid a lot for comic books, you, you know. I mean, yet because of, they don't make a lot on comic books, right? It's more limited audience, you know. So, was there any story from your time at Marvel and from your time with Iron Man that really stood out to you as like, wow, this is this is this is good work. This is something I'm super proud of, and like your favorite, perchance. I liked the whole Mandarin run we did. I was very pleased with that. Um, but uh, I was really pleased with this. We got, there was that, this event called Civil War that was a, a Marvel Universe event. Um, where, familiar with it. Yeah. And we, we came on late in Civil War. And, and Captain America was sort of the rebel guy. He was the guy who was sort of like the, and, and Tony Stark was kind of the, the establishment guy you know and so everybody when we came in had gotten to where they hated tony stark and hated iron man <laughs> so it had been all one side and we kind of had this thing of we have to resuscitate you have to sort of sort of you know make this make this character somebody who people go oh wait yeah maybe there's another side here you know and um we only really had two up two issues to really do that in and I feel like we really did a good job, you know. Um, and I really was, I was proud of those two issues because we actually introduced spiritual things into it and, and, and prayer into it, you know. And, uh, you know, um, so, so yeah, yeah. It was, it, you can do things in comic books that you, you can't do in other medium, you know. Really? It's it's shocking to me that probably how how little we know about the writing and producing and directing, and I think to me those always kind of seemed like one job. Uh, whenever yeah. I saw them, um, maybe because so many people are the writer, producer, or director on more well known properties. What is the difference between being a producer and being a writer? Like what what is what goes into that? Well, the model in feature films is the. Uh, and this is fairly, everybody will always say, oh, that's a director's medium, you know? And that's that's fairly new. That's That only really happened around the 70s, and it happened after Francois Truffaut introduced the auteur theory and took a look at, um, you know, kind of cherry-picked all of 
Alfred Hitchcock's, you know, work and made a very good argument that it didn't matter who wrote the scripts, it was always an Alfred Hitchcock movie. And there might be some truth to that, but what happened with the auteur theory is it, the director became kind of the king of making movies. Whereas in Hollywood in the old days, it was the producer. It was the, the guy who, you know, who, 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 who produced the movie. Um, in television, it's always been writer directed. It's been writer is the author, author of TV. So it's two different models. But there's the yeah, there's there's some directors that are really good writers. Um, and there's there's some writers that are really good directors. But it's so writing and directing. I've directed before, and directing is a very different kind of activity than writing you know um and and there's very few people who are as good at one as they are at the other you know uh, i think the best situation is where you have a writer who writes a screenplay and a director who directs it you know and i like the tv side of it because i'm i at the end of the day i'm the one that makes the the, the i'm the one that makes the decisions about what the writers or director is going to be doing you know um, mm -hmm. And I think sometimes, like you look at features and where the auteur theory's kind of taken us, is like you take these big movies. These the, it'll be um, they're not really movies. They're not, well, they're they're not. I'm not going to go to you know. I'm not going to go to where Mar you know Martin you know Martin Scorsese went with this, but they're more. They're not narratives. They're pageants. It's like you picture them going, wow, and a director coming up with a really good, you know, a really good sequence. And we got to do this. And this will be good. Um, oh, this will be awesome. And then another sequence. And then another sequence. And so the movies play, they don't play like a story. There's not a strong narrative thread through the story. It's almost like going to a parade and watching a series of really spectacular floats go down the street. But, oh, there's a theme this year of parade. The parade theme this year is ducks. So everybody has to do ducks to this year. And, and so every, everything is thematically connected by a very thin sort of theme, you know, but there's not a strong narrative thread. There's not, it's not a, it doesn't build, except in how much, how big and spectacular each sequence is. So that, that's why I'll go to a movie like that um, Fast and Furious or any one of the Marvel films and I'll thoroughly enjoy it. I'll have a great time watching it. It's usually really terrific, but I walk out of the theater and I can't remember what the hell happened. <laughs> it's like, it would be like going to a fireworks show and it's a spectacular fireworks show and then trying to tell somebody about it. It's like, there, because the narrative thread is what Oh, this happened. Then this happened. Then this made that happen. Then that made this happen. So you've got this thing you're, you're you can you can relate you know, verbally, you know. Whereas a pageant or that kind of a show, it's hard to know what followed what. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, because because it doesn't build on anything. It kind of just it's a series of sequences, you know. Um. So I, and I, so that's why I like TV. T, on TV, story is very operative, you know. Um, you, and TV now is, to me, I mean, we're in we're in a golden age now. I mean, we're in the middle of like uh, uh, some really amazing stuff being done on TV, and it's really because it's like the Theodore Sturgeon rule is nine, you know, 90, 90, 99 percent of everything is crap, or ninety percent of everything is crap. Well, now we got five five hundred and fifty scripted shows on. So statistically, like what fifty five of them should be worth watching, you know. Whereas in the old days, there was three networks. There's maybe twenty or thirty network shows. So maybe two or three of them were worth watching. So it's, it's just like numbers, you know. I've noticed. I've tried to go back and like watch some older shows that I enjoyed years ago, and I've like this doesn't really stack up. Um, no, I don't hold to, up very well. Like I watch uh, Law and Order, and I'm like, this isn't very good. This is like I I know what's going to happen. It's happened in every show so far. Yeah, well, Law and Order Law and Order is a form of propaganda. It's a it's a oh oh no, no no no. Now I'm interested. Please what? tell me more. 
Well, no, I mean, there's certain shows on TV that are there. Um, it's like comfort food, okay? And they're there so that, you know, people are in their houses and they look around and there's a, there's a, there's, there's a dissonance between what they see and what they, and what ha and, and what they're told. And, and they, they see people getting away with crime or away with bad things around them or not being punished for doing bad things or even being rewarded for doing bad things. And shows like Law and Order are all, basically they're all the same show. And that is somebody does something wrong, a group of people who are very competent and very conscientious and, and incorruptible, um, they, they, they investigate it and then they go to trial with it and the person who did the bad thing gets punished. And people feel good about that. It makes them feel good. So, so it's, there's messages in there. It's like, oh, well, always cooperate with the authorities. <laughs> you know, <laughs> never, never question the wisdom of the authorities. The, there are subtle kinds of propaganda, propaganda work, you know, working in that. Doctor shows, very similar. Oh, the person gets sick. The person disregards the advice of the physician, goes on the family vacation, and then gets sicker. And then the doctor, through heaven and earth, makes, you know, pulls out all the stops, manages to save the person's life. And the lesson is from now on, listen to the doctor, listen to the authority figure, go to sleep, go to sleep. <laughs> All right. So I'll ask, that, do you have most, a, that's most, no, I, I, I'm, I'm with you. I, I like where this is headed. Do you have a particular piece? I love propaganda. Like I love the old school um, cartoon propaganda from world war two. Yeah. I think it's very telling of a time and a place. Do you have um, a particular propaganda show where you're like, that's, that's my, that's my feel good stuff. That's my junk food. And you just enjoy it for that. Well, see, it's sort of like, it's well, see, here's the thing is, is I'm impossible to watch a TV show. with. My wife goes insane because I've, I, I've been working in the sausage factory. I know, I, I know what's being done here. I know what decisions are kind of made and how it's, put together and, and whether it's just the way that the narrative works. I was watching a show with her. It was a family, no, it was about a family. It was one of those big sort of heavy duty family dramas. And it was a multiple thing on, and I don't even remember what, what it was. It was on one of the, one of the streaming networks. We were watching it and I said, okay, well in, I would say in the next two to three sequence in the next two to three scenes from now, that kid is going to get diagnosed with leukemia. Oof. And she said, oh, shut up. That's ridiculous. I said, no, he's going to be diagnosed with leukemia. And then like three scenes later, they sit there and it's like they're at the doctor's office and it's like, your son's test came back. You know, he has a case of chronic myoplastic leukemia. And I'm going, and I'm going, Yes, you know, yes, I told you, and I threw my wife, and she just says, "Turn the television off." I don't want to watch this show. I don't want <laughs> this show anymore. And I'm, I've got very high standards. It, it, most, I think, most, I think when I talk about like the propagandistic aspect, I don't think that it's you know it's some sinister freaking thing that the networks all collude on, and they go, "Okay, well, let's 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 manipulate the sheeple." It's like, well, these kinds of shows seem to work. These are the kinds of shows that people want to watch. And people want to watch shows that make them feel like the world makes sense. They're less comfortable with shows that question that the world makes sense. They get a little upset with those shows. Those are the shows I like to make, you know? And, and I've done both. I've worked on both kinds of shows. Um, but, uh, you know, I, uh, yeah, if you look at the broad spectrum of network dramas, but then there's those, like you said, you can watch shows. They don't hold up very well later on. Production values have improved. 
immensely in the last 20 years. Movies, movies and TV shows look almost the way they're lit, the way they're shot, the, the production values. They're much more expensive to shoot than they were. When, when I was growing up, like if you were growing up during the time where they're making the A-team, the, they were spending a buck and a half on those fucking things, you know? Um, I've seen that Jeep flip yeah. over the same way nine different times. And exactly. I, yeah. I, I remember there was very clearly one episode of the A-Team where the Jeep flips over as they're shooting at the ground, and you can see the pneumatic pump. <laughs> that it, it, it's built on the bottom of the yeah, chassis yeah, no, and it the, just flips the, it over. Yeah, it's like, a, it's like a mortar that makes it flip over. Yeah. Any other time, I would think like, Man, they should have covered that up, but it's just like moving on. <laughs> Don't oh, worry about it. I was talking to a dude who was like an old dude. I love talking to old stunt dudes and old, you, you know, those guys. That's one of my favorite parts of the show. It's like they're doing this is talking to all these guys who were doing that back then. And and he was on the Dukes of Hazard, right? Oh. And and he said in the last season the network had cut back their budget so totally. And the first of all, he goes, "Yeah, what we would do for car accidents is up." He said, we would go to car rental places. We'd rent a car. We'd insure it up the, you know, the max and we'd just destroy it. And we <laughs> ran, we, like our guys ran out of car, car rental agencies, like in the entire LA County area that we could rent from. They all were all onto us. And the last season he said, it, we actually shot, we, it was a general Lee flying over something. And it, we had so little money. What we did, it was just, it was like, it was like two guys. There's one guy with a camera pointed up at the sky, and two guys, and they're 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 rolling in slow motion, right? And it's two guys playing catch with a General Lee matchbox car. <laughs> I mean, that literally happened. It's not a. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, I watch I watch shows sometimes old, but then there's shows that you watch and they don't hold up, but they hold up. Now you're enjoying them for a total like the A Team's one of those shows where you enjoy it for a completely different reason than you did when you watched it. It's Miami it is Vice so, is that way for me. Yeah, it's so cheesy. What is it? Miami Vice. Oh, Miami Vice. Yeah. When I was a kid, I would watch Miami Vice and I'd be like, "That's that's cool. Uh, that's that, cool." Yeah. yeah. Now I watch it. I'm like, "Wow." That is that is quintessential '80s craziness right there. That they just like do not mind. Yes, someone fired a rocket launcher in downtown. It's yeah, not yeah, making yeah. the news. I'm like, it's not making the news. Like we should call someone. Someone should care about this. I, I, I Sonny you, Crockett has killed 37 you, men today. Maybe it's time for Crockett to take a day off. Like, well, there was a there was if you know when, I, when a friend of mine did this. He said, you go to Siri and you go, okay, well, how many how many people did Marshall Dillon kill? And it's like in the hundreds. He was the most prolific serial killer ever on TV. It's like, and it'd be like, yeah, not 19 women, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you get, you know, how many times was Marshall Dillon shot? It'll be like 17 times in the shoulder, 19 times in the leg, you know, right shoulder, left shoulder, left leg, stomach, back you know once in the head you know <laughs> um so i i sometimes see uh i, I guess the more the most well known is chekhov's gun when we point something out to the audience ahead of time to be like yeah. this may be important later i just Do did you, that i just did that in a story i just wrote a day ago yeah oh okay it's it's one of my favorites uh, also the only one was, i know the real name yeah, of it, it literally was a gun in on a on a wall yeah. I, I need at some point I just need to have something where it's like, oh, that's Chekhov's gun, and then just move on and never return to it. Um, yeah, well, you kind of have to, you know. They, well, the, the whole idea being, well, if there's this, it needs to be fired by the end of the episode, right? You know. Do, so with those rules and those tricks and everything that you you spot so easily in television now, is there one that's a favorite of yours? One that you you particularly enjoy using? A device that I really enjoy using. I don't, you know, where I go is I go, these are devices I don't want to use. These mm. are things I, you know, I more go to, oh, wow, I don't want to pull that one out. That's jump bait, you know. I mean, that's, she, the, the the one I least like is the ticking clock. I'm kind of, I'm kind of tired of the ticking clock. And, 
and it works every time. And, and, and it's one of the biggest notes you get from the studios is can we put a ticking clock on this? And you usually end up saying, okay, fine, let's put a ticking clock on it. Sometimes it's literal, you know, um, uh, like a countdown, you know, is you can't help but have a ticking clock on that. But, you know, the, the, it's like, it's like, I, my thing is having two people kind of come together and, and, you know, there's a conflict there and, and it, and it, and they, they end up going off in a direction you just don't expect them to. I mean, for me, I need to be surprised by what the characters do, but I need, when I, when I, they do do something unexpected, the whole idea of, 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 uh, of Chekhov's gun is that I go, oh, okay, because that makes sense. You know what I mean? Like, I had, it's not coming out of left field when somebody does something. It's easy if somebody behaves completely ir illogically, which happens in a lot of m movies and TV shows where they just, why would he do that? Like, how many times are you watching something and going, why on earth would he decide to do that? Or how did he know that was going to happen? Or how did he know such and such was over in that house? You know, um, I, I like to make sure everybody understands why, at least why somebody super smart or attentive would know why there was a guy with a rifle and a scope on him. You know what I mean? Um, it, it's just, it, to me, it's sloppy to do otherwise, you know? So speaking of shows and things where we have a super smart uh, character, talk to me about The Blacklist. Well, The Blacklist, I came onto that right after I did Dracula and I was hired by the uh, showrunner, John Eisendrath, and he was he, he liked my work. And, uh, and it was James Spader, and he was sort of an anti-hero type. The concept being this guy is the number one most wanted guy and he goes, turns himself into the FBI and he says, uh, his premise, the premise is, I will, there are guys who are worse than I am, and there's a whole bunch of them, and I will, I will help you, I will help you capture those guys. Um, I will assist you in capturing those guys, but um, I need to work with this one specific FBI agent who is like this junior, brand new female of uh, agent you know that's my one thing and so the whole idea being you don't know what the relationship is why her um there's clearly some kind of backstory between them and so there's a lot of that and then the idea being every week there's this sort of super criminal um that you know he he basically you know puts him out of business you know the team works together and it's it's the same pattern of, of sort of like I said, feel good. Okay, well, hey, this is this FBI group, and they have their conflicts inside. It. By God, they're keeping the world safe, you know. And um, and so there's there's a bit of that, but James elevated it. James Spader is an amazing talent. He's been Agreed. doing this. He's he's been doing this since he was almost I mean a teenager. So his story. He's a very very hands on producer. Um, a lot of uh, stars will get that executive producer credit, but it's just uh, an avenue for them to get a little bit more money per episode. Um, James earns every penny of it and more. So he's very involved in helping shape the episodes and, um, and he's, he's, he's really great to work with. The, the, uh, that I was on, I, I, it was tough because it was a very, it's a very buttoned down kind of format. And, um, and I don't, you know, I wrote an awful lot of, I did a lot of uncredited writing the first season, the second season. And uh, I was, there's a two year contract and I'm usually not a staff guy. I'm not a, I'm not a session musician. I'm a composer. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I was kind of like, okay, I'll do two years. I've never been on a hit series before. That's new. And it was fun to go out and people say, what are you working on? And say it. And they'd go, they wouldn't go, what? I mean, first time I told them, it's like, what show do you work on? Oh, I work on the blacklist. I mean, Slater was like, oh my God. You know, it's like, <laughs> um, and so it's nice to be working on something that was actually a, a popular hit. And, and uh, it was a grind because it's, it's 22 episodes and it's a huge endeavor every year. 
um, to do 22 hours of television. Um, but the but the second season was my last was on my last season. I was done with the blacklist, and um, we came up on a episode it was episode three eighteen. It was the third season, the eighteenth or three nineteen, and I thought I was going to be writing one thing, and they said, "No, no, no, you're not going to be writing that. That's going to be episode three twenty. We want you to do this other thing. The network wants us to do one episode that's just all about all about Red Reddington." And I said, well, that sounds really cool to me because I really love working with James. And um, I kind of pitched him this idea and they kind of like, oh, okay. And they, John, John Bokenkamp and John Eisendrath broke an episode and then they brought it down to me and I just was like, okay, well, I'm done. Like they can't fire me. This is my last year, you know? And I haven't, <laughs> I haven't written one of these things that's really mine. You know what I mean? Where it's like, right? I've been basically a good soldier in sort of writing that series, and I thought, no, I, this is because this is a weird episode anyway, you know. And uh, we can, it's, it's, a, it's an episode where we can really break the format, you know. And so I just went, I just basically just wrote this thing, Cape Cape May, this episode, Cape May, and. uh I think when I turned in the draft, I think we were really right on top of pre-production. There was not a lot of time to change it or fix it. And I'm pretty sure that, that my the, my bosses were not happy with me. <laughs> and, and but James loved it and he got he really got behind it and and the network really liked it and and the, the showrunners got behind it and we made this very weird it's basically the most subversive episode of television I've written in my entire career because it's it's a standard, you know, you got in the template, it's inside the template of, of sort of a network procedural series. But in essence, the whole episode plays like a European art house movie. And so it was really kind of fun, you know. So that was my that was my experience on the blacklist, really. Um, I did it. I did another season. I did a third season, and then I just said, "I, you know, I'm kind of done with this. I, I just, I needed it. I needed to get a change up." So I, 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 uh, I said, I, I told, I told them, and they were very kind enough to let me out of my contract and and let me go on and move on and do other things, you know. So. So is there anything that we we may have missed over or skipped over that you think that, you know, we should absolutely be talking about? Something from your career that um, maybe aspiring television writers might want to hear about or anything like that? Well, I mean, I'd say getting, uh, breaking into this mess. And as far as being a, you know, I was really fortunate Um because I broke in very late in life. And, and to me, uh, when you're a writer, um, you spend, before you become, you know, what you're digging your story well, right? And I got this, the story well is that it's, you dig a deep hole and, and, you, and, and that hole, it consists of everything you've experienced, every story you've heard, every single thing you've seen, whether you've seen it in real life or on TV or whatever, every single bit of data that's come in to your, into, your, into your head during the course of your life, and that's what's going to color and inform and inspire what comes out of your head. And I was fortunate enough in that I was a very late bloomer, and so I had a really deep story well going in. Um, you look at people like Charles Bukowski, who didn't really break out until they were around, you know, he was in his late fifties. He had a really deep story. Well, I would just, I would just feel like, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna do this, whether you're gonna be a novelist, any, an artist is, is, is focus on just being as, you know, getting as good as you can get and make sure that every every day you take a step in improving your craft and eventually somebody's going to sit up and take notice. You don't have to put the cart before the horse and, you know, and try to 
try to sell yourself. It, your work will sell you. And, you, you know, this is a great time because you can actually, you know, pull people together and shoot something. It's not that expensive. You can, you, we, there's cameras that, you know, there's, there's prosumer cameras that don't cost a lot of money where you can shoot um, compelling, you know, a, a compelling drama and put it up on YouTube and everybody on earth has access to it, you know? And so just go, go do it. Don't, don't make, don't play mother. May I just do it. You know, you might not make money at it, but you're doing what you love doing, you know? And that's better than a sharp stick in the eye versus <laughs> talking about it. You know, I mean, who wants By to hear far. somebody talk about it? I mean, there's nothing more boring than somebody who's talking about doing something. I, I, I used to, we'd be breaking story and I'd be sitting there and I'd be thinking, you know, breaking story to me is the most tedious part of the job. And it's like, it's like, you know, I just want to dive in and start writing it. All I need to know is the end. If I know the end and I have like a couple of beats inside the story as an itinerary, I'm, I'm on it. You know, I can write it then. I just finished a, a, a pilot where I really didn't know exactly what was going to happen during the course of it. Um, I just need to know what the end of it is. You know, what what's my destination? Where am I taking this guy? You know? So. Um, do you have anything coming up that you can talk about? Anything that you can mention? Or is it all under lock and key right now? I have a couple things. I have... I have uh, Right now, I have the 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 Imagine Nickelodeon project called the Astronauts, mm -hmm. and it's basically about five kids who are. It's about three days before the launch of sort of, it's sort of like a company, kind of like SpaceX, run by like an Elon Musk type entrepreneur, and there's going to be there's a a mission that's going to be going to and it's an interstellar asteroid or something that's passing through the through our solar system and they're going to rendezvous with that and it, you know and then and it's like a mission of discovery and these kids are sitting around they're all they all their parents all work in one capacity or another for the, for the company and they're sitting around a motel pool because all their families are staying there for the launch and they go hey we got they haven't get an opportunities to basically go there and and check out the ship close up and personal and take a few selfies and you know hey this will be great and the ai on the ship is kind of gone rogue and it the, it lifts off with these five kids on board and um and i've been really it's the it's it i'm so happy with it's it's something there, you know, I'm really, I've been wanting to do something like this for so long because so much family drama. There's two things that drive me nuts about it is number one is the kids are smart and adults are stupid, which I hate. I really hate that. Um, so I wanted to do something where it was more realistic. I don't know. And also every family is totally dysfunctional. And it's like, no, that's kind of the exception. Most families are fairly functional, you know, um, it, and and just you know the the just and also it just it's like you watch them you sit with watch something with your kids and you're just waiting to get ambushed somebody's going to put something in that's say political or or something's going to make fun of something that you hold you know that you hold really you know it's important to you and you got to have that weird talk with your kids afterwards where you go, you know, when he said that, that's not quite true. You know what I mean? Right. And, and I thought, no, I just want to do an intelligent family drama. You didn't have those conversations when you watched an episode of like the Andy Griffith show, you know, mm -hmm. everybody took care of each other. Even when they had conflicts, it was just a misunderstanding, you know? And I just wanted to do a gentle sort of, but exciting show. And this is, they, they really let me do that. Nickelodeon has been the best network I've ever worked with. They've oh, wow. Been, and they have let me take some really deep dives. I mean, in our second episode, 
I have an 11 year old girl looking at a bunch of 11, four other 11 year old kids and saying, we got to work together because if we don't, we're going to die up here, you know? And having a character that age say that is pretty heavy duty stuff. In a, in yeah. A, and Nickelodeon has been, they've been supportive all the way down the line. I've just been thrilled. So will this be, will this be on the network itself? Will this be streaming? Where can we see it? It'll be on Nickelodeon. It, it'll, it, they'll be promoting the heck out of it because this is, they're pivoting. They want to get more into the family sphere away from the kids sphere. Right. And um, it's the most expensive one show they've ever done. And so, but we got four episodes done before the coronavirus hit. And, and so we've been um, on a hiatus waiting for an all clear so we can go back up to Vancouver and finish the other six episodes of the first season. Um, so I'm very eager to get back to work on that. So when do we premiere? We don't know because it's all going to rely on how long we're shut down. You know? Right. I'm hoping that the kids, you know, we come back and the kids don't have like beards. <laughs> 17 the years kids, old. They're, they're all going to look like you, Jack. Oh, <laughs> we all need to foot, work together. Six foot seven, big beards. Oh my God. <laughs> Us kids need to work together. Oh, okay, calm down. <laughs> yeah, or or even worse, just one of them will have. Yeah, a just one of them. Like... It's, yeah, it's like, what's this character's name? I'm Jeff Epstein. You know, it's like, <laughs> Ooh. no, it's, it's, no. Now it's creepy show. I can't. <laughs> well, Daniel, thank you very much for coming out with us tonight. This has been a great conversation. I've really enjoyed it, and uh, hopefully, it's been we can. My pleasure. You know. Really great. I hope we can have some other ones too. I, uh, but uh, to awesome. Well, Mike, if you want to go ahead and play us out, my friend. All right. Hey, just like to thank everyone for tuning in today. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, be sure to give us a like and subscribe to the channel. And if you've got any ideas for what you'd like to see in a future show, leave us a comment and we'll take a look. Stay tuned for more.